Okay, we are in the middle of Torah Yud in the part part 10. Right. right? Torah Yud Ot Yud. And we're in the middle of this. What Rabbi Nachman does here at the end is he takes the, all the aspects that we spoke about in this Torah, all of the ideas that we spoke about in this Torah, and he fits it into this Pasuk that he began this Torah. And this Pasuk, Ve'ela Mishpatim. And that's why this Torah, Torah Yud, is called Ve'ela Mishpatim. What we want to do is it'll help us to remember the Torahs if um, at the beginning of every shear I say that we are in the middle of Torah Yud, but it's called Ve'ela Mishpatim, for example. right? Because if you remember, always remember this Torah and you associate it with the name, Ve'ela Mishpatim, and each Torah you associate with that specific name as opposed to just a number, it's much easier to remember it. So this Torah Yud is called Ve'ela Mishpatim, Torah called Ve'ela Mishpatim, because he begins the Torah with speaking about this Pasuk. He brings this Pasuk, and then he explains all of this, this whole Torah, and then he fits it into Mordechai and Esther and the whole story of Purim, and then he fits it into the whole story of Rabbi Babar Khana. And now finally, he's going back to the, story, the, the Pasuk that he began with, and now we're going to fit it all into this Pasuk. And we saw the beginning of that yesterday, where Ve'ele is the aspect of Gaiva. The Ve'ele is the aspect of adding, of it being more than seeing a person, seeing oneself more than what he actually is. So that's that's the sheker, that's the idol worship, that's the lack of, of emuna. And uh, when a person uh, follows the ego, um, the ego, the ego tendency to uh, completely distort a person's self-image. Um, the self-image is fine to have a healthy self-image, to have a positive self-image. It's not only fine, it's a mitzvah in the Torah. It's tremendously important. But when a person does that in a way where it's disconnected and separated from the Almighty, from the Rebona Shalom, so that's the Shekhar here, and that's the Gaiva, and that's the Avodah Zara, that's the idol worship, and that's the, the corrupted belief systems that we're talking about. And that's the Ve'ele, that that's what's hinted to in Ve'ele. And that's represented by Amalek. And the world in general is represented by Amalek. That's the aspect of Haman. Now what's the next word in the Pasuk? Hamishpatim. So Hamishpatim is representing the Ruach. The Ruach HaKodesh that we spoke about is in the heart and we have to draw it into <clears throat> the arms and the legs. Hamishpatim bechinat Ruach, kimosh katuv, ule Ruach mishpat meshive milchama. Pasuk in Yeshayahu, it says, and for the spirit of judgment, for the Ruach of judgment. There's a Ruach of judgment. Okay, now what, what is that? So Rabbi Nachman always does this. He always brings us psukim in order to prove that this aspect equals that aspect, that this bechina is the same as that bechina. He always does that. But that's wonderful, and we have to pay attention to the psukim. He wants to show us the secrets of the Torah from the psukim itself. Because yes, he can give a great drasha and explain with pilpul and with, with philosophy about how this aspect is equal to that aspect. But at the end of the day, he always goes out of his way to find us psukim that show us the comparison and the connection between these two ideas. So Kabbalistically, there's a tremendous connection between the Ruach and the Mishpat. And it's a connection that Rabbi Nachman himself speaks about in Torah Bet. Uh, what, is he, what is the connection? The, the Ruach... In the Kabbalah, the Arizal says that a person has nefesh, ruach, and neshama, chaya, yechida, the five parts of the neshama. And the nefesh of a person, it's mainly, it mainly dwells within the liver of a person, within the kaved. The ruach of a person mainly dwells within the heart of a person. And the, the neshama of a person dwells, well, sparks of it, uh, appear within the moach, within the brain of a person, within the consciousness here. Okay, now the ruach being in the heart is in the heart, as according to this, and the heart is a place of mishpat. Where do we see in the Torah that the heart is a place of mishpat? Judging and discerning and, and making a judgment is is comes from the aspect of the heart. We see that from the choshen. The choshen mishpat it's it's on the heart, the breastplate of the kohen god. So the the mishpat is connected to the heart. And the heart is the aspect of the Ruach. And so that's a beautiful connection. But, and Rabbi Nachman has given us that in the past, in previous Torahs and in a few places in the Kutim Moran. But he still goes out of his way to show us from the Psukim. Okay, so what's the Pasuk he brings from Yeshayahu? That there's this aspect of the Ruach of Mishpat, the spirit of judgment. Okay, and that's the connection between Ruach and judgment. The judgment is a Ruach, is a spirit. Okay, wonderful. 
Because through this Ruach, this Ruach of judgment, of holy judgment, the Ruach HaKodesh, we are rectifying, we are dispelling and removing all of the Avodah Azar, all of the idol worship, all of the idolatry, and all of the Gaiva, and all the ego, the ego of a person is rectified and removed from him through that, through that Ruach HaKodesh, through that Ruach of judgment. Because when a person sees things clearly, so then all of that Sheker, just just dissolves, just falls away. Asher tasim lifnehem, the next part of the pasuk. So we spoke about this yesterday. Yeah, we spoke about this yesterday. And so asher tasim lifnehem, we said yesterday, lifnehem in plural implies men and women. We saw the the, the famous gemara, the mechilta that says, "Hushvu uh, isha leish lechol hadinim shebatorah." Men and women were given all of the, the, the decrees or the judgments, the, not the decrees, the dinim, the halachot of lotase, of Hashem equally. But we explain that on a deeper way. Rabbi Nachman explains that on a deeper way, meaning that for any judgment or difficult decree in Shemaim, right, any divine judgment, if you want to sweeten it, you need to equalize, you need to make equal the man and the woman aspect, the, femin- the male and the female aspect, you need to be unifying in order to sweeten the judgment. And how do you do that? <clears throat> That's what he says now. <clears throat> sweetening the judgment. And tomorrow's Daf Yomi, the Gemara says, in Mesechet Brachot Daf Zayin, the Gemara says that there is once a day that Hashem is, uh, is filled with anger, the wrath of Hashem. Once a day, and it's for a moment. Rega, rega kememre, like the amount of time that it says that it takes to say rega. <clears throat> it's one out of 800, one out of two, one out of a thousand, that's rough, a thousand and eighty. The hour, according to the Torah, is split into 1,080 parts. Not 60 minutes, but 1,080 minutes. Okay, so you take an hour and you split it up to 1,080 parts. And one of those parts is the amount of time that Hashem is filled with wrath every day. And that's the time that Bilam HaRasha wanted to curse the Bnei Israel, and it would have an effect. So the Gemara says, when is this time? When does it happen? So the Gemara says it happens within the first three hours of the day. With one of the moments within the first three hours of the day, that's the, the rega that Hashem is filled with wrath. And then the, and the Gemara finishes off and says, when exactly is it within? So the Gemara says that when, all, when the kings of the east and the kings of the west wake up in the morning and they bow down to the sun and they bow down to their idols, that's the time that Hashem's wrath is, 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 is revealed, when there is, when there is wrath by Hashem, the divine wrath. So this is exactly this whole concept that we see time and time and time again within Likud Moran, Rabbi Nachman brings this many times, how the whole aspect of Kas is a lack of Emunah. Why? Because idol worship is the opposite of Emunah. And whenever there's a lack of Emunah, it's in an, an, on some level, it's an aspect of idol worship. And so whenever there's lack of Emunah, there's more Kas, there's more uh, uh, wrath, and there's more anger, and there's more frustration, and there's more uh, depression. All of that is drawn from the concealment of Hashem's infinite divine compassion. Okay, so, Kikozman, so that's what this is here. He brings this here, another Gemara that says the same idea. As long as there is still idol worship in the world, there is, a, there is judgment, dinim, decrees, and divine anger is found in the world. When there's divine anger, so then there's also anger by people. Right? These are connected. Okay. Not only that, but on a deeper level, idol worship in itself is an aspect of anger. Because anger itself, according to the Kabbalah, is a lack of that. Right? The Pasuk says that the Kaz, the anger, it dwells within. Uh, only within those that are foolish. And foolish, the one that is a fool, according to the Torah, is the one that is lacking that. The difference between someone that is a fool and someone that doesn't is not a fool is that someone that is not a fool has that. Someone that is lacking that is called a fool. And that's the two ends of the spectrum. So the cast dwells within the heart, within those people that, have, that are fools, meaning they're lacking that. So 
the lack of that is the lack of emuna. That is the aspect of emuna, is the aspect of dvekut in the Rabbana Shalom. And the opposite of that, lack of emuna, lack of emuna is being fooled. That's where the cast dwells. That's where the anger, the frustration dwells. And so it makes sense that when someone worships idols and when a person lives their life with a corrupted belief system of idol worship, lack of emuna and Hashem, it makes sense that they awaken the wrath of Hashem because within themselves, that is what is going on. They have only this anger. They might not be aware of it. Maybe they're not throwing uh, dishes across the room, but they are living in the energy of anger. The lack of emuna energy is an energy of anger, of frustration, of depression. All of these are synonyms. It's one aspect. It's one thing that is expressed in different ways. Depression is anger that is taken and suppressed inwardly, but, but it's all the same thing. It's all the same energy. And so it makes sense that through that, they awaken the wrath by Hashem, so to speak, right? Because as we are, that's how we affect uh, the the Hanhaga the, of the Rivon Hashem Hashem Tzilecha, Hashem is your shadow. Whatever we do, we cause like a shadow that Hashem will, will, will be revealed to us in the same way. The Hanhaga of the Rivon Hashem, the way Hashem runs the world, will be revealed to us in the same way that we live our lives, okay? Like today's Shir Shalyam too. Lo ye bacha kel elzar, the Gemara Shabbat and Kofei, yeah. Wow, the same kind of thing, right? Because the Gemara there says someone gets angry, it's like like an idol worshiper. It's like an it's like an it's like an idol worshiper, and like the like the Ruach, the Arizal explains on that pasuk. The Arizal explains that when a person falls to guy to anger to cast, he says that a person's neshama leaves him, and in its place he is filled with a Ruach of Tuma. A ruach of klipa that is filled in its place, and that ruach is called elzar, and that's why the Arizal explains. That's the explanation of the pasuk: Lo ye becha elzar. Do not cause that the elzar will be within you. Wow! But as neshama yeah. leaves him and gets replaced by that. That's what that Arizal says. Yeah. So that Arizal says that one of the worst things that a person can ever do is is gaiva, lose one th- one's temper. He says that a person can work for years and years and years, meditating and and getting step after step of of achievement, of spirituality, of connection to Hashem, of Dveikut, of Ruach HaKodesh, and in one moment of Kas, you can lose it all. Wow. Okay? So that's all the, all the spiritual achievements of a person can be lost within a moment of Kas. And Rabbi Nachman says, not only the spiritual achievements, Rabbi Nachman speaks about the physical. And Rabbi Nachman says that whenever a person falls to Kas, you should know, or whenever a person is challenged, Something happens that could challenge him to fall into losing his temper. And again, when we say losing one's temper, yes, Darizal is speaking more specifically about th- like throwing dishes across the room type of thing. But the, the way Rabbi Nachman, when you see in the Kuti Maharan, the way he speaks about anger, it's also very connected to depression. Depression is a form of anger. It's losing one's temper where a person does things and acts in ways that are destructive to himself or to others. So usual anger is destructive to others. They, you know, they, they, they scream out or they, they curse out or whatever, right? And they speak hurtfully to other people. So that's also a form, that's, that's anger outwardly. It's destructive to others. Depression is when a person is destructive to himself. Right, um, and, and so these are all aspects of losing one's temper, Rabbi, losing the daft. Rabbi Nachman says when a person loses one's temper, or he had, he's challenged to lose his temper, you should realize that in this moment right now, in Shamaim, they are deciding to give him a, 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 a suitcase full of, 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 of bills, a suitcase full of money. There's a package of money, a peckle of, of, of guilt that they want to give him in a Shamaim. And the Yitzhahara, he wants this person to lose it. He wants to, he wants to, uh, dis- he wants to take it away from the person. He wants to, he wants to cause destruction. I mean, he wants to want, cause pain and, and lack and deficiencies. And, um, and so he wants to sabotage this treasure that they want to give him, this money that they want to give him, this package of money, this success, monetary success that they want to give him. And so the opposite of monetary success in the physical form, it, the, the energy, when it's turned on, it's upside down, that energy turns, is turned into kas. And he brings a pasuk. He brings a pasuk of teref natani re'av. Teref natani re'av is the sustenance that Hashem gives to those that fear him. Again, fearing Hashem is also an aspect of that. Yerat Shamaim is synonymous with that. And so Hashem gives sustenance to those that fear him. Teref natani re'av. But the same word teref, when you change around the, the way you pronounce the word teref, right? So that word teref, tet, resh, pei, can also, if you change the pronunciation, uh, it turns out, it turns into the word Toref. 
Toref is like the word, the Pasuk Toref Nafsho Be'apo. Toref Nafsho Be'apo is a Pasuk that's said about someone that gets Bekaz, that he loses his Nefesh, like we saw what we said from Dariza. And so that's a pasuk about someone that has cast. So like the, the famous rule from the Baal Shem Tov, that mina shemaim, the letters of Shefa, the, the Shefa that comes down from Hashem, is letters of the Aleph Bet. And a person, the way he lives his life, he will affect change in how those letters are pronounced and what's the combination of those letters. So sometimes you have, let's say, the word, the letters Reish Tzadi Hei that comes out from Shaman. It's tremendous Shefa. And if a person is a tzaddik and he lives his life properly and in alignment with, 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 with Hashem, with Hashem's chiyos, with Hashem's Torah, then, a pers- then those letters will be combined in the combination of the letters Ritzei. Ritzei is the Ratzon of Hashem. But if Chas V'Shalom, he does the opposite, those letters can be uh, changed around to spell out the word Tzara, Chas V'Shalom. Okay, so the same thing here. You, know, you have Teref and you have Toref. The same letters, and not only that, the same letters, they're also in this instance, they're in the same order. Mm-hmm. But just the pronunciation is different. And that difference of the pronunciation is caused by changing the energy, turning it around upside down. And the Yitzhahara does that. He causes that the chef of Teref, Natan Reaf, that is coming down to this person to turn Chas Shalom into Toref, Nafsho Be'apo, into a Kas, and then he loses his money. So not only the Ruach HaKadosh, the spiritual achievements, but also physical money, physical, physical good, a person can lose through Kas. And so it's something to be aware of. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing, especially when a person is about to lose his temper and, and he starts thinking negatively about the fact that he's about to lose a package of money that they want to give him from Shemaim. So usually it's even harder for a person to keep his temper at that time if he thinks about that, right? So it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of inner work and it's a lot of um, rewiring of the brain. That's what it is. It's about rewiring the brain and, and, and causing connections in the brain that a person that you usually, in such a case, would have gotten angry. Now he sees things differently, and now he has a different reaction. Uh, he reacts differently, okay? Proactively reacting differently, okay? <laughs> Anyways, yeah. so, I should have seen him. So through this Ruach HaKodesh that you have in the heart, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Ruach of joy, happiness, which is the Ruach of, of serving Hashem, this tremendous feeling of abundance and happiness and, 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 and vacuum, that everything is perfect, already here and already now, everything is wonderful. Right, and you have that in your heart, and you increase that to the point where it's drawn into the hands and into the feet, and you you dance and you sing and you clap your hands. That causes the unification of kuchar bichush chinte, and through that, the sweetening of the judgment happens. So that's the mechanism behind this eitzah that Rabbi Nachman shared and taught us in this Torah. So now he's going to summarize. Vehine klal advarim elu. The rule or the, the, the sum up of all this, So, the tzaddik is the source of this ruach. We said that the ruach is drawn from the Torah, but how is it drawn from the Torah? It's drawn from the Torah through the tzaddik. The Moshe Rabbeinu draws it from the Torah and gives it to Am Yisrael. Okay? So that's learning the Torah of the tzaddik. When you learn Gemara, when you learn Chassidus, when you learn uh, Tanya, whatever you learn, you open it up, you're drawing, you're getting that ruach drawn from the Torah through the tzaddik that wrote that Sefer. Okay? So that's the, the ruach that is drawn from the tzaddik. It, what it causes, it removes and dispels and it dissolves all of the idol worship, the corrupted belief systems, the kfirot, all of that is, is removed through the holy ruach of the tzaddik. And when that is removed, right, so it's drawn into the hands of the feet. And at the time, before the person merited this tikkun, in the place of the hands of the feet, there is this ruach of tuma, the ruach of the, of the el acher, of the idol worship, of the, of the corrupted belief systems, etc., of the gaiva, of the ego, of the pride. And now this ruach is drawn into the hands of the feet and removes it. And so now the hands and the feet become light and filled with the energy of joy and happiness. And they start, um, they start uh, singing, they start dancing and clapping the hands. Okay? And so when that comes, when that comes about, so that means that what just happened is that the emuna 
was drawn into the hands and in, into the feet, and it's revealed in the hands and the feet. The emuna is now drawn and revealed within the hands of the feet. Okay, and so he says that this is we see this in the pasuk when it speaks about Yosef Atzadi. The pasuk in, by Yosef Atzadi, Paro said this about Yosef. He said that without you, without your permission, no man will lift up his hand or his feet in all of Eretz Mitzrayim. What does that mean? Without the aspect of the tzaddik, without Yosef, no, no one will be able to lift up. An uplifting of the hands and the feet happens from because of this ruach of Yosef that is drawn into the hands and the feet. Beautiful. That's, a, that's amazing. I, was, I thought that was such a strange post when I saw it just, yeah, just recently. It's like, what is that talking about? <laughs> that amazing. makes so much sense. Yeah. So, what do you learn from all this? What, com- what is one of the things that comes out from this Torah? One of the side points. He's going to address a side point now. One of the side points that comes out from what we learned is that we said, in Mordechai, we're putting Mordechai in the aspect of the hands and Esther in the aspect of the feet. Okay? So he says, and we, not just the hands and the feet, we also said in Mordechai is the aspect of the revealed part of the Torah, and Esther the aspect of the hidden part of the Torah. So now we have kind of like a question, something that is unclear, because I would think that Mordechai should be the greater aspect. He was the tzaddik of the generation. He was the rush of the Sanhedrin. And the greater aspect of the Torah is the aspect of the hidden part of the Torah. It's, more, it's greater than the revealed part of the Torah. So why are we saying, why are we putting Esther in the, in the hidden aspect of the Torah and Mordechai in the revealed part of the Torah? So that's the point that we're going to address now. Okay. Okay. So he gives an answer, and the answer is something that's very deep, something that needs to be, we need to contemplate what, it, what is going on here, and I have a few ways of explaining it. But uh, the, the, the idea in general of what he's saying is like this. He says that, yes, the hands are higher than the feet. And therefore, it makes sense to say that maybe um, that the revealed part of the Torah should be in the feet and the hidden part of the Torah should be in the hands. Uh, it, just the opposite, right? No. That we would say that Mordechai should be in the feet because Mordechai is the aspect of the... Uh, the hands, we would say that Mordechai is the hidden part of the Torah because Mordechai is, is the higher aspect. And we would say that the hidden part of the Torah should be in the hands, not in the feet. Okay, that's what we wanted to say. The answer is like this. The answer is that, yes, the, the hands are greater than the Torah and the hidden part of the Torah is greater than the revealed part of the Torah. And if so, if so, so then why do we see that we see earlier that the hidden part of the Torah is represented by the feet? So he says that that is not absolute, meaning, yes, in general, if you see the body as one and you see the body, the parts of what's called a parts of the whole mirne, the whole, uh, the whole anatomy of the Torah, and you would say that the hands represent the revealed part of the Torah and the feet represent the, the hidden part of the Torah. Yes, that is accurate. However, however, when the Torah is being revealed, there is this, there's this idea that is taught in the Tikkun Zohar that the revealed part of the Torah is revealed on a higher place than the hidden part of the Torah. The, the, the hidden part of the Torah, I'm sorry, it's getting confusing. The hidden part of the Torah is revealed in a higher place than the, the re- revealed part of the Torah. Okay? Meaning that... that it, it gets basically, the wires get crossed, okay? What does that mean? That means that, yes, the aspect of the feet is the aspect of the hidden part of the Torah. The question is, if the hidden part of the Torah is the aspect of the feet, it shouldn't be the aspect of the feet. It should be aspect of the hands because the aspect of the hands is greater, okay? So the answer is, the answer is that the, 
the revealed parts of the Torah, Hidgaluta Nigleu Bimakom Gavua. The revealed part of the Torah is revealed on a higher place than the hidden part of the Torah. Okay. In Tikkun Azar, it says this in a different way. In Tikkun Azar, and this is where he is getting this answer from, based on something that it says in Tikkun Azar. In Tikkun Azar, it says that the, we have Tanaim and Damaran. The Tanaim wrote the Mishnah, and Damaran wrote the Gemara. The, the Tikkun Azar says that the Tanaim are in the feet, and the, the Amoraim, who wrote the Gemara, are in the hands. How does that make sense? The Tanaim are greater than the Amoraim. And the answer is that the revelation of the revelation, the revelation of the hidden part of the Torah is in a lower place than the revelation of the revealed part of the Torah. So that's why the Tanaim are in the feet and the Amoraim are in the hands. And that's why the hidden part of the Torah we're saying is in the feet and the revealed part of the Torah is in the hands. Because when the Torah is being revealed to us, the Torah is being revealed to us, the hidden part of the Torah is revealed to us on a lower place uh, relative to the revealed part of the Torah on a higher place.